so that's wonderful that we were able to start with um, with Roma art. It's nice when these conversations um, are framed with actual music and art because um, we can kind of get into these theoretical discussions. But it's a nice reminder that these are actual embodied practices. So it was um, it was nice to kind of set the tone with that. Um, so for our conversation today. We have um, three panelists who I will introduce um, in a little bit more detail than they've been introduced so far. So we have Timea Junghaus, who is an art historian and contemporary art curator. She is the executive director of, um, of ARIAC um, since its founding in, in September of 2017. Um, she has researched and published extensively on conjunctions of modern and contemporary art with critical theory, with particular reference to issues of cultural difference, colonialism, and minority representation. Um, and she has received awards for her curatorial work as well, which includes the Roma component at the um, exhibit uh, The Hidden Holocaust at the Budapest Kunsthalle in 2004 and the first Roma pavilion at the 52nd Venice Contemporary Art Biennale in, 20, uh, in uh, 2007. And this is just a few of many other um, examples of, of Timea's uh, curation. Next, we have uh, Rosa Cisneros. Um, she is a dancer and choreographer, dance historian, critic, Roma scholar, sociologist, flamenco historian, and peace activist. Her PhD is in sociology with a focus on Roma women, intersectionality, dialogic feminism, and community communicative methodologies. Rosa, uh, Rosa is a professional dancer, choreographer, curator, and qualified teacher who has lived and danced in various parts of the world and collaborated with many flamenco um, artists as well as other leaders in the dance field. Currently, she is at Coventry University's uh, Center for Dance Research um, in the UK. And finally, we have Daniel Baker who is an artist and curator and researcher. Um, he is a Romani Gypsy born in Kent, and he holds a PhD on the subject of Gypsy aesthetics from Royal College of Art, London. Um, Daniel curated Futu Roma at the 58th International Art Exhibit at the Venice Biennale in 2019, and he acted as exhibitor and advisor to the first and second Roma pavilions, Paradise Lost and Call to the Witness, uh, called, called the witness at the 52nd and 54th uh, Venice Biennales, respectively. So I just want to send a warm welcome and thank you to all three of our panelists for being here today. Um, it's nice to see you again and kind of continue some of the discussions we've been having um, over the last um, couple months. Um, and happy uh, 50th anniversary um, to all of you. So I wanted to just jump right in with uh, with a question that was in the panel description, um, which is how can art, music, and dance be utilized as a useful tool for political change and empowerment? Um, so I didn't have an order. Um, maybe we can just go in the order that I read your bios. So um, Timea, if you would like to to start, that would be great. I hope I managed to unmute myself. Hello, everybody. Hello, dear colleagues. It's wonderful to be here. I'm so happy to contribute to an event fostering our future and speaking uh, together and being together uh, with Roma youth. So um, uh, I think that the introductory videos were truly inspiring um, because uh, we Roma have uh, have now been present even uh, in the political sphere with our discourse, with our words, with our voices. Uh, we now have established institutions, uh, even on the transnational level. There's other institutions such as ERIAC, but uh, we have to recognize that fighting anti-Gypsyism and really changing stereotypes, changing mindsets is very much of a cultural mission. Uh, so when we are considering how to project an image which is more uh, up to date, state of the art, more uh, competent uh, and uh, trendy, uh, culture can do much more uh, than us in the public sphere individually or simply by our voices and speeches and texts, which are similarly important. But uh, dance, performing arts, visual arts, uh, music are the tools that can really transform 
the the future Roma image. Uh, I am convinced about this. Hello everyone. Hello. Um, I agree with everything that's been said and you know I think that arts and culture are an entry point into reflecting on some of the social, cultural, political aspects of a community, of an, an area, a country. So I think that you know it's definitely it can be political, it is political whether sometimes we want it to be or not and there's also a real kind of embodied knowledge and wisdom that we carry that the arts, whether that's dance or something more tangible, that it allow it it gives voice to that in a very specific way. And so, um, you know, and also arts, as I said, is an entry point, and we can just it, in some instances it can be an equalizer for us to really come together to talk. The act of doing something. Um, you know, shifts energy. Maybe that's kind of the dancer in me. But you know, the act of making something, you know, allows us to to engage and and be in ourselves in a very different way. So for me, it's it's very much a political statement. And in some instances, art is made as a form of protest. And in those contexts, it's very specific, and it might have a very specific message. So there are many ways that I think culture and and arts. Um, can be used to make statements and be political. Daniel, if you could just unmute yourself. Um. Good. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, yes, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I'll just read it again. I've got it written down here just to, to refresh people's memories. How can art, music and dance be utilized as a useful tool for political change and empowerment? I think the act of art making is empowering in itself on a personal level. So that's a good starting point. Um, also, I think it's important to look at two aspects of this. One is from the perspective of the artist, which is um, important because in a way, they're producing objects which then go out into the world and are utilized for various uh, means. And another way of looking at it is from the um, agency or the person who is using those artworks to foreground a particular message. So there are kind of two two separate areas there, I think, i.e. The, the artist and the, um, the dissemination of the artwork. Um, but I think that resistance remains at the core of uh, Gypsy uh, artistic practice, Gypsy Traveller and Roma artistic practice. So that's that's also a kind of fundamental aspect which makes the very act of creating political. Um, but when um, in the past various groups have um, uh, sort of worked toward emancipation either through political or academic means, um, this has been very effective but I think artists expand the array of possibilities by bringing what are often very personal perspectives to particular questions. So um, I, I'll show a couple of examples of, of things very briefly. This is um, something that I made um, for an exhibition a while ago. It's a flag which has been widely used and this basically it's um, clearly resituating the an element of the Roma flag within the EU flag and I've done with this with a number of different flags so this is um, kind of producing at the same time um, an icon of um, integration but also a symbol of resistance so in itself it kind of produces a very complex um, political idea and I've taken that forward with another piece in the same line which is um, this LGBTQ Roma flag which again emphasizes the idea of intersectionality and how we with objects and with cu our cultural um, participation we can emphasize commonalities across oppressed groups so this is another way of of focusing a complex idea on a relatively simple image I just want to finish with this picture by um, an artist called Laszlo Varga, which unfortunately we weren't able to secure for inclusion in the Future Roma exhibition. So instead, um, I produced a thousand of these postcards, which people could take away from the exhibition. Um, the reason that we couldn't secure the object was because some technical reason um, with the 
Museum of Ethnography in Budapest. Um, they have a fantastic collection, which the public can't see. So this object in itself brings forward question. And here I'm using someone else's artwork and, and positioning it in a particular way to emphasize ideas of Roma cultural capital and how our, how our access to that is being denied in many cases. So that's just a few examples of how art can be used in these ways. All right, thank you all so much um, for these comments. So I have a list of questions that I'm gonna kind of try to charge through, but if any of you have follow-ups on anyone else's, please feel free to, um, to take the conversation in a different direction. I want this to be like very um, organic. Um, there's so many threads we could pick up on just from that one one but i'm going to i'm going to ask another question um because all of you have so much experience in um in this domain you know we've gathered here commemorating 50 years since the first roma world congress and i'm curious how each of you would narrate or characterize the developments in arts and cultural production um roma arts and cultural production at this transnational level um but also the shifts in discourse so how we talk about um, Roma arts and culture in the last in the last five decades um, and we don't have to go in the same order also well I think um, w one of the main um, characteristics is that we've moved away from this idea of a kind of um, of Roma art production as a kind of um, um, collective effort, a kind of um, uh, a primitive kind of group um, production uh, in which kind of, um, you know, individual expertise is kind of overlooked. Um, and what instead what we have now, kind of interestingly, is uh, very much um, artistic production by Roma as critiquing and challenging contemporary art practice. I'm speaking mainly about the visual arts because that's my field. So what's happening now is rather than it being kind of sidelined or not even not even in the line at all, it's being um, looked at as a way of, um, in, in some ways the contemporary art world measuring itself against some of the voices that have been oppressed in the past. And I think, um, What's interesting as well is that um, a lot of the practices which are now coming to the fore, particularly in the contemporary art world, are really drawing upon um, ideas and elements which reflect a very kind of communal and family-based idea of, of artistic production and the value of that, which really sits, again, sits kind of in great contrast to the very individualistic idea which underpins contemporary art practice. So I think as well as kind of um, challenging current um, contemporary art ideas, we've kind of emerged from this kind of um, murky sea of, of kind of faceless uh, um, folk production. Rosa, I'm curious what you think of what what Daniel was just saying because I know you've talked about this idea of like the mahala and like as dance and um, flamenco and ritual kind of like springing from that. And I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the country, on the you know where what art form or practice we're we're looking at because flamenco has gone through a wave where it's been commodified and the idea of um kind of the community mahala side of it has somehow been removed and the stage that performance that you know the the capitalist ways have really influenced and you know, in, in some contexts, you can see kind of the legacy of the families, flamenco families, and that kind of main be, being still very present. Yet at the same time, there is kind of the removal of the person and the individual Roma, non Roma. It, you know, it's like about the art form and how can we capitalize, how can we market this? Um, and then that's, you know, led to some other kind of appropriation of cultures and it, it so it's quite tricky at the same time you know i do feel that there's also a movement of 
you know, individual artists kind of having that space and claiming that space. But it also opens up a, a tricky balance around having archetypes or, you know, tokens, you know, of, of the community. So it's it's quite, um, yeah, I, I think it it's moving in the right direction. I think we just have to kind of be aware that there are these tensions in the room and that, you know, also the positions of privilege that we have in, in this, you know, conversation. And, you know, I think that that's been... By reflecting on those that positionality, I think then we can continue to honor the kind of physical as well as the metaphorical idea of the mahala, you know, because I feel like the four of us here, we're a community, right? But we also have to respect that we're also expert, we're seen as experts, right? And, you know, that I always find that really, really tricky. So, yeah, so it's a little bit of a paradox for me um, that yeah, I, I slowly kind of find my personal way through it. And as I'm kind of navigating and asking myself that I'm also asking other community members or academics and yeah, so how do we still maintain the mahala? Because that's really important. Um, I mean, it's uh, humbling to speak after Danielle and Rosa. So just a, a few more words. I, uh, I, I am extremely proud of how, how far we came in the past 50 years. At the first Roma Congress, um, our, uh, our elders, um, some of us, some of them are still with us. Um, uh, very few of them, unfortunately, but they, uh, first declared the need to claim Roma authorship. And as uh, Danielle said, until that point, the millions of photographs, the artifacts, the objects, uh, uh, the uh, the culture, cultural heritage, even tangible heritage that is connected to us Roma people were archived and uh, and stored on the names of the folklorists and ethnographers, and uh, uh, anthropologists who have researched Roma and uh, and look at today Roma the notion of Roma art and culture is part of the global artistic circulation uh, you see uh, how Roma hip hop talks back talks back in the very feminist sense that bell hooks uh, the feminist theorist the black feminist theorist tells us uh, and uh, uh, very uh, clearly uh, saying this in the trendy way, you know, the decolonial process is irreversible. Uh, there is absolutely uh, a claim, especially by Roma youth, that events in politics, arts and culture cannot take place without the participation of Roma and Roma shaping uh, uh, the image about Roma. And uh, another uh, in other paradigmatic shift that uh, that we must celebrate and it and it is really defining the future how all the problems that Roma have faced that have uh, basically dominated the discourse about Roma in the housing health education and employment uh, these are problems that we have faced uh, but we do not let these problems to define the discourse about the Roma future and we very much depend on arts and culture and we use uh, the vehicle of arts and culture to make sure that we do have a positive discourse uh, and we are shaping uh, not just the discourse but actually the very presence uh, present and uh, and the future of of the roma world thanks so much to me that um that really sets up kind of the next um question that i wanted to um, ask maybe Daniel and Rosa have um, some thoughts about this idea too of um, the way in which a lot of the time Roma art is framed as a response to anti-gypsyism or anti-Roma racism um, as a kind of talking back like Timea said um, or or if not as a talking back to but as a working through of trauma or persecution um, of, of persecution and racism um, and then on the other hand, as Timea is pointing out, we have artists um, like, and, and this is also underpinning the Future Roma exhibit, but also Roma Futurism coming from Mihaela Dragan in Romania, these artistic um, practices that are sort of um, saying, you know, I, with Fanon, right, because Fanon says this, I am not my history, 
right? And they're rejecting that oppression of the historical trauma and saying, here's a utopic vision of, of Roma-ness, right? In the future tense. So do you see that as a tension? Can these two things work together? Can Roma art be both um, responses and talking back to oppression and also envisioning the future? Um, and how, I guess, you know, relating it to this panel, how do both of those things um, respond to the transformative power of art? I mean, for me, I don't, I can't separate the two. I feel that because of that embodied kind of experience, the cultural trauma, you know, the 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 way I was raised is a reflection of my mother's reality and her, you know, so that legacy is inside of me. And I, I want to respect that. And I want to honor that, even as, you know, traumatic as that might have been. However, I also feel that I have agency in the next step. I have, you know, I've been given many tools to kind of reflect and to challenge and to, to decide what that next step might look like. So I do think that there is a utopian way and another way. And, you know, the vulnerability or the trauma needn't be kind of a lack of hope or a lack of, you know, that is the the kind of transformative bit and i think that's powerful and the art practice helps personally helps me kind of make informed choice the way i was dancing or or being is very different from the way i would be you know in flamenco we have that idea that we have a saying that the older you are the better dancer because you've lived more you have more to offer you have more experience and so you know i believe that that's true and and i believe that we have a choice in how we react to that past and how we, you know, talk back. And we also, you know, are in the moment now deciding on what that next step will be. So, yes, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, if you could just unmute again. Sorry. Um, Yes, it's a very good question. I think the most powerful art is that which combines um, the processes of remembering and imagining. Um, uh, I mean, in, in remembering, we kind of um, uncover what might be obscured. And I think that's important because so much of our history has been obscured by, by who it was written by, i.e. not us. Um, and in imagining, we kind of invest into another future. So the kind of the ways in which those two operations um, occur at the same time um, produces, I think, what are the most interesting works and the most powerful. And I think that's also where the political can be actioned within the artwork. So I, I agree with Rosa. I think they're kind of, they need to be occurring at the same time um, in order to, in a way, figure out where we are now, what we're doing now. We need to be looking backwards and forwards at the same time. Now, that's a very old, um way of approaching life it, i'm sure it, it, it's it's ingrained in many many kind of um religious kind of um ideas um it sits very much against the idea of the very western forward-looking approach to progress i.e a straight arrow pointing forwards this cyclical approach i think is very much present within within the roma way of thinking and we share that with lots of other other groups as well that's that's really helpful um that it's, yeah exactly it doesn't need to be a, a, a direct linear progression but um it can oscillate between between the two timid do you have anything you would like to add um not uh, not too much actually i just want to make sure that uh, you know to imagine an utopia uh, we need to imagine uh, how the infrastructure is available also for Roma. So for me, the question is not really on the creative process itself, but how it remains something that has this identity of Roma connected to it in the future. And for this, we need institutions that specifically focus on making sure that Roma cultural production, self-representation, access to cultural heritage, access to cultural participation remain not just in policy and in websites and national papers on the agenda, but also within Roma institutions that are built on Roma recognition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I want to take a little bit of a detour um, towards this kind of the colonial thread that that you brought up to me, and then we can come back to this kind of institutional um, level. So, you know, if we're thinking about Romani art as as transformative um, and even as as a tool of of decolonizing kind of Western art. Um, because of its, and we've talked about this before, it has it has this ability to critique universal norms, right, of European modernity, and and particularly of Western aesthetics. And I think Daniel, you've, I've heard you talk about this, um, the the idea that gypsy aesthetics are are kind of pushing back against um, against accepted uh, conventions of art. So. I'm curious what your thoughts are, I guess, kind of on a theoretical level about these things, but then also um, what are some ways that you see this as curators, as artists, um, uh, actually happening with, with Roma artists today? Or maybe not even today, maybe also historically. Um, ways that they're kind of pushing back against accepted conventions of Western aesthetics. Who would you like to go first? Sorry, you're muted. Um, I'm, if you could start, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I made some notes on this. Um, so the so, so some elements of um, the Roma aesthetic, um, in my understanding, would be ideas of display and concealment. So. Um, in a way, obfuscating the the exterior view um through various means through, through various very playful means and i think that 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 occurs in lots of the work that we see but to be more specific um in terms of we're well, going back to this idea of the communal and the familial um which is very much part of the, the the gypsy aesthetic i think and that's very much in play in some of the works that we see for example like with from the future omer exhibition with selma salman who who shows us um, a painting of her working with her father and her brother, dismantling a, a van to, to recycle and to sell uh, to kind of a scrap metal. So that idea of the family activity occurring within kind of this, this very interesting artwork, very powerful artwork, it is, is bringing those ideas of the, um, the gypsy aesthetic into, into the contemporary art space very successfully. And again, challenging this idea of, of individualism, which is which is kind of the underpins the um, the the whole idea of of, of, of contemporary art today. Um, other things like um, living lightly on the earth, recycling. Um, again, that's picked up in Selma Selman's work, um, also in Dan Turner's work, which is about kind of um, regeneration and growth and recycling um, in terms of of growing. Uh, plants on the roofs of of Roma homes to to um, turn into herbal remedies, which could be sold. So this idea of kind of making something from 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 very little in a way is very is very interesting. But also, I think um, again this idea of the communal, um, the bringing domestic artistic practices into the realm of the contemporary art and using contemporary art modes of working to utilize these. Um, kinds of ways of working and that's seen with uh, um, within the work of Celia Baker and my mother who was in the exhibition and um, Sestakova who, whose embroidery were, was kind of a, a major part of the exhibition so I think there are lots of ways in which these elements of the uh, Roma aesthetic are present and just going back to this idea of obfuscation of in a way concealing through display I think um, this is present in the work of Delaine Labar when often her face is covered and um, in my work especially I, I never use the human figure because I think that the idea of picturing the Roma body is is such a kind of sensitive topic and it's so powerful and it's been abused by so many people in the past this idea of using a picture of a gypsy to prove a point or to make a point i think that's very dangerous and i think this idea of us in a way removing our bodies from from that space is is a very uh, radical act and i think that's very powerful so that's another way of um using that but i think also that's underpinned by the fact that within roma um 
visuality, visual culture, historically, the, the human figure doesn't appear. So this is something that's not something new to us. It's something that's kind of part of what we've grown up with as, as a community. This idea that somehow the human figure, depicting the human figure, somehow doesn't seem quite right. Maybe because we haven't had the opportunity to actually see ourselves fully in the world. If uh, I may continue exactly where uh, Daniel left uh, off, uh, just to add. So um, I think it's important, uh, you know, to bring this idea of decoloniality, which is very much a central term of current uh, cultural politics, closer uh, to our audience. And uh, I just would like to say that it's nothing really uh, challenging uh, for us any longer because we are experts of the decolonial practice. We have been, uh, if we want to really simplify um, this, we can uh, depend on some literature and say that this practice is unveiling some truth about our history. And we have been diligently doing this since the first World Roma Congress. Roma intellectuals are writing Roma history and rewriting uh, the story of victimhood to the story of Roma agency and uh, and uh, and Roma heroism, Roma resistance. Uh, we are uh, writing the history uh, of a different art history in Europe, which is now a history from the perspective of what the Roma model contributed, what Roma artists contributed to the formations of Western nations. We are doing the unveiling the truth. And the second step of this process is doing the surgery on ourselves. So Rosa earlier said we are a community and we are continuously discussing amongst ourselves, learning from each other, the peer support, the community support, the familiar and the communal, as, uh, as Daniel just explained, is present and is developing amongst us Roma. And the third step of this process shall be healing together. So we can continue this process uh, of transformation only together, not just with the future Roma youth who is present here today, but together with allies, uh, supporting institutions, those who believe in Europe, uh, gigantic European institutions such as the Council of Europe, healing together assumes that Roma and non-Roma work together on healing the vows of not just the Roma community, but our work together. I just want to reflect on two comments, well, the two um, points that both of each of you have made. And I'll, I'll reflect on that using a current project that I'm working on around a children's book. I'm co-creating a children's book with Roma families here in the UK who are from Slovakia or Romania and even some um, English uh, gypsy families. And the, 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 and it's supported by an, a major art organization here in the UK, Arts Admin. So, you know, Tina, you've been saying that also institutions have to support Roma arts and culture and to have the, the, them commission me and to understand that this isn't about an output necessarily of me as one artist, but my whole kind of way of working has been around co-creation, all of the families would be paid, that there's really something kind of cyclical in that and honoring that way of working. They understood that and they also, you know, part of the project is around reflecting on this trauma, on the reality, on the lack of human rights in their home countries and how that plays out here in the host country and how kids are also dealing with that. And so the writing of the children's book is a space to come together, to, but to also make and say, okay, this is what we want that children's book. This is how we want the children's book to be written. And we're doing that together. And this children's book is, will then go to the schools where they're in. So again, it's taking something um, that is familiar to us and kind of the intergenerational way of working and making and creating and then saying, okay, this is how we want that to, and how we want to write the next step. And, you know, and in the workshops, we've been doing this online. Um, you, you know, it's been beautiful to see how the kids, we have kids from three years old to 18, you know, really reflecting on this. And 
I don't say, okay, we're going to talk about politics. It comes up naturally. It comes up in such an organic way where one of the kids had drew Spider-Man and Spider-Man wrote the queen a letter and said, queen, you know, please save my park, but please, you know, listen to me, love Spider-Man. And, you know, the power in that and the, the kind of, it's just, it's so transformative to see that. And, you know, but they're thinking, you know, the children, the youth are thinking about that. And, you know, the families in the schools are also aware that the children do have an awareness of political powers and that those powers have a really important role to play in this, you know, instance, cleaning up the park. So, you know, that kind of triangulation for me is just a reminder of why, A, we have to use the youth, why we need, you know, cultural arts institutions to support us, but also this idea of co-creation, that it's not one, but, you know, that together we're much stronger. Um, so, yeah, I offer that just as a reflection on both comments. Thanks so much, Rosa. Um, I think that that makes sense to kind of maybe go into this um, this institutional um, question, and then maybe we'll come back to what Tinea was saying about Roma healing, which I think is really important. Um, but what it really struck me, what Daniel, you're saying about this um, this kind of community and family being part of the Roma aesthetic, as opposed to and kind of challenging the idea. Um, of, of Western art, which is really about the glorification of the artistic genius, right? It's about, in my case, Bach and Beethoven and, and about other, you know, painters in, in your domains. So if, if that's, um, I was listening to this webinar with, with, with Mignolo, who he was saying that, you know, if, if Western art is about the glorification of the artistic genius, then the museum is the coronation of the artistic genius, right? And we've been having all these conversations about like the need for a Roma museum um, with, with area. And so I wanna read a little quote from Nicoletta Bitsu for Roma MoMA who said that, quote, while the idea of a museum as a static const construct is valid, I think it is perhaps not the best form to respond to the needs and realities of our people. Virtual spaces and itinerant mobile, mobile units may ultimately be the best fit for us, Roma, end quote. So I wanted to just throw those two things out there and kind of ask to what extent you agree and disagree, and then also just open the floor to more comments about the institutional um, support that's necessary. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I agree partly with what Nicoletta says, um, but I think that lets that lets society off much too lightly. You know, if they've had big museums, why can't we have big museums? So we 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 need to inhabit those spaces, you know, uh, in our own image before we can discard them, really. So I think, you know, both can happen side by side. Um, you know, to, to, to just have a virtual peripatetic that that you know governments would love that because they don't have to spend any money on it so we need a big museum a huge museum to put all our stuff in and you know let lots of people come and see it Timea Rosa do you have any other yeah, comments? you've already said a lot about institutions I'm uh, surprised actually of Daniel Daniel's um, uh, bluntness uh, about this, uh, I, I agree, of course, um, but uh, I, I also would be very careful, you know, because I think that the state of the art space for Roma cultural production is absolutely necessary and for Roma self-representation, at least on the European level, one state of the art space, and I'm sorry I say this in a European capital, which is also supportive of, uh, of Roma arts and culture. Uh, and I also uh, would like to say that at the same same time, I really don't think that any of the national collections, because we must admit there's over 30,000 objects now in state collections. So this new space, this new museum, 
uh, or new transnational cultural center should not be looked at as a predator that will take away and claim uh, immediate restitution for uh, all the Roma artworks and ever created cultural production because one of the strengths of Roma art and culture is how adaptable and generous it was in shaping national cultures. I mean, our music is, you know, romanticism in music and, and Roma music are uh, inseparable, just like the flamenco uh, is an inherent part of Spanish uh, heritage now. That uh, uh, So, uh, you know, these uh, symbiotic, um, symbiotic uh, living together with other culture is our strength. We cannot isolate and we shall not be looked at uh, looked at with this new institution as the predator that will take away existing collections. There's plenty of ideas, amazing deep creativity within our community. So in a very, uh, how shall I say, fast decade, we could fill up a space uh, with our own cultural products and uh, the community participates within it. Thanks, Mia. Rosa? Um, I'll just reflect on the digital component because I think that there is a strength in that and I feel that, you know, especially now we're seeing, again, how adaptable and how generous, as Timia just said, we are and, um, and resilient. And so I think that this digital aspect can be can connect us in a very different way um, and is useful. I also agree with Daniel that we do need to have our space and we do need to ensure that, um, that you know, we're not a threat as Timia just said and that the, there is um, a real, you know, it, that we can make art at, you know, that can sit in any of the museums and we can have our own museum, you know, and that, that those two things aren't, shouldn't go against each other. Um, so, yeah, and I, you know, I, I don't think it's an either or, I don't think we should live in those binaries. Um, I think, yeah. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we have about seven minutes left. I'm, I'm gonna go back to this, um, this idea of, of Roma healing that, that Timea brought up. Um, and partly because I'm, I'm curious about it for my own work. Like I, I look at kind of song as uh, Roma song specifically related to the Holocaust as places of um, sonic healing, right? Where, where we can kind of, kind of coalesce around these songs as sites of memorialization. Um, but even outside of the kind of treatment of, of persecution, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if you all could, could reflect a little bit on, um, from your individual perspectives, the, the, the importance of art as operating as sites of remembrance, but also for, um, for forging community and belonging. And I guess we've kind of already touched on this um, slightly, but maybe we could develop it a little bit, bit further, like the importance of of art within this kind of, you know, of uniting across these transnational um, landscapes of really, um, you know, forging a Roma nation. And, and when I think of music, you know, I, I'm thinking of, you know, Petra Gelbart and I, we talk about the fact that, you know, there's not some kind of unifying aspect of Roma music, and yet we can say the term Roma music and, um, and like respect its heterogeneity while also recognizing its kind of um, ability to, to unite, um, you know, under this umbrella of, of Roma music. And I'm curious if that's similar in the domains that you all um, work in. I mean, in, in dance or especially in flamenco, you, you know, there is the hierarchy, the singer, the guitarist, the dancer and you know the way I was taught was very traditional that you have to learn to listen yeah the dancing the technique all of that comes in a way later but to be able to listen you know and what that means is to listen to the singer listen to the music what it's saying how do you enter into that conversation and so the music is kind of the heartbeat of 
you know, flamenco. And, and I think that's true in, in the dancing, you know, in any dance, you 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 would have to listen to, to what's inside and, you know, allow that to have its own space. And I think that that's quite powerful and it does unite people. Um, and, it, you know, that listening is also about listening to the past. There's, um, when you hear flamenco, it, it aw awakens something in you because it's also going back, it's, there's a, trauma that's there there's a, a healing that you know all of that is embedded in there and they they don't you can't separate the two and so the dancing is responding to that music and to that song um and that's you know quite important to to remember especially now the flamenco is kind of this globalized art form where it's online and think of the and five six seven eight you know but actually if, if in a traditional way, you wouldn't even have numbers, you would just have the rhythms and the sounds and that has its own kind of lineage and historical uh, reflection of, of our of our history. So yeah, I leave it there. Uh, Daniel, and please feel free to make comments like unrelated to my very messy question. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Thank you. Um, in terms of visual arts or material culture, I think it's very important to have um, emblems or icons to kind of coalesce around um, with ideas of, of, of remembrance. <clears throat> um, but I think that becomes more, even more powerful <clears throat> if those objects or those, that imagery is um, kind of transcends uh, the Roman position to, to, um, to have meaning for wider groups as well. So, because I think it, if those objects or those artworks can um, speak to a wider group as well, they draw more people into the conversation. So I think um, it can have a, a kind of a twofold effect by allowing us this, uh, this site of social and cultural agency, whether that be remembering or, or, or otherwise or action, but it can also give a message to beyond beyond our group to kind of um, maybe eliciting a different kind of agency. Timea, do you have any yeah. thoughts? On yes, uh, I mean, I could speak forever, but I really enjoy listening to you uh, and learning from you. Uh, I, I just uh, want to see, say that, uh, you know, that we had this uh, uh, kind of, um, how shall I say, time period of, uh, of uh, um, trying to, uh, how shall I say, stay competitive with what is going on in mainstream culture. Uh, and, uh, and, I'm, I, and I think that uh, this meant that, uh, that we had a lot of things to prove and speak to the majority as if we are proving uh, that the notion of Roma art has legitimacy, that, uh, you know, we contributed to national cultures. All these statements that we have, maybe they still need a repetition. But let's be honest. Uh, Roma contemporary art producers and, uh, and creative individuals are absolutely virtuos at the moment in their own uh, technical expressions they keep up completely and competently uh, with uh, with the majority producers and uh, this is uh, for why i am often often feeling that really the the future really depends on how we carry on the radical idea of not just healing, but the radical idea of a very progressive Roma nation, one that invites, as Daniel said, universal participation, one that projects more uh, than it is in itself, so that it is attractive for others as well, an idea of connecting a community of active people who act for democracy and healing together in the future, uh, you know, that, that we can imagine a nation that has transgressed homogeneity and nationalism and racism 
uh, and uh, and has a radical vision for the future. So I am I am really focused on this part of the term now, Roma, and not just the part of the term that is arts and culture. Uh, even today, inspired by April 8, of course, perhaps this is just uh, why this is happening to, to my own conscious. But uh, I think that the key for the future is also on this idea of how we carry on this beautiful Roma nation with our flag, with our anthem, and with what we have achieved uh, in the past six centuries and in the past 50 years since the first Roma Congress. Oh, thank you so much, Timea. Um, we are at the point where the audience is invited to submit questions. We have about 15 minutes left. So if anyone um, who's with us has any questions for the panel, um, please feel free to use the chat um, function to write those in. Um, I don't believe that there's a way we can have you actually ask your question. Um, but if you could leave it in the chat and then I will um, I will read it out. Um, and while we maybe wait for folks to, to write in some questions, um, Timea was, was kind of, again, foregrounding my next question, um, which was about, um, you know, in this, in this context, and Timea has already highlighted um, in the past and in the session, the importance of, of um, uh, Agnes Darossi, who organized the first exhibit um, of Roma artists, and I think it was in '79. Um, she'll correct me if I'm wrong. So, if the I'm I'm curious if the panel could reflect on um, the significance, both historically and contemporarily, if that's a word, of claiming Roma um, authorship and artistic production um, on a transnational level. Um, you know, why, why is this going forward? Why is this important? And then how, how do you envision this taking place in the future? Um, and I guess it's a kind of question also of like, what's on the horizon for you? Um, what's on the horizon for the, the Roma movement? Um, how are we, how are we going forward? If I may start this time, um, uh, I just would like to say that uh, the European Roma Institute for Arts and Culture continues to seek young talents uh, in all uh, genres uh, and also in many innovative and experimental um, uh, uh, territories as well. So uh, this is a good space for me to say, you know, if you have some creativity which are unsourced, please turn to ARIAC and show us and inspire us and let us learn from you. Um, and uh, otherwise, I must say that Agnes Dorothy's first international exhibition was a real breakthrough. Uh, such a breakthrough that uh, let's not forget that two years later, later Sandra Jaya in France uh, repeated an international exhibition. Uh, the Art Mondial d'Artzigan was the title of this exhibition. So Agnes Dorothy inspired a line of international transnational events. Uh, so for uh, for those of us who have worked later on on international projects, we must keep in mind that, uh, uh, you know, we are a minority, the largest minority on the transnational level um, in Europe. Uh, and uh, and we, one of the ways in which we can continue to, to carry on this notion of Roma art is work on the transnational level and never stop seeking new talent. I agree completely with that. And also that um, Agnes de Rocci's exhibition was enormously influential. And um, without that, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, but I suppose I see the next step as, um, which is happening undoubtedly, more um, in terms of the visual arts, in any case, more artists from Roma backgrounds being taken into international collections of great importance, international museums of modern art, 
that's really the next stage i think and i think that i think we're almost there um so as well as i know i kind of banged on about the idea of having a big house where we can put everything you know all our artwork i think we need to be generous as well you know be, we need to to um have our artists present within these influential collections around the world because that's whether we like it or not that is a kind of marker of of excellence so in the same way that we've done that um you know with the venice biennale started by timea and um, continued with Ariac uh, in the most recent version i think um we need to accept that that's where we need to be that is happening um i think it's an unstoppable force and this is an interesting question because when it comes to individual artists i think many are torn about the idea of where they place themselves within the kind of contemporary art um you know array but that's for, probably for another conference but um yeah the next step is definitely more international collectors and museums stepping up and acquiring our work you know how long do we have to keep banging on about this for you to actually make a move Um, thank you for the question. Um, I agree with what has been said. And for me, the next step is to definitely give, continue to carve out spaces, whether that's in major institutions or at a grassroots level, for people to, you know, feel that they can create art, make art. And if they need to explore issues around self-identity or if it's, something that has nothing to do with their kind of cultural background, but both are valid and to just create spaces where that, where arts and culture can, can be part of, of their everyday. Um, and to feel permission to go into a major museum and to feel that they, you know, can question that critically or, you know, or, or just kind of be in the space. And, and, you know, so for me, it's all, it's about ensuring that agency and and that you know the especially the youth you know feel that they they can go into those spaces and not have to fight so hard and that us kind of the older people can kind of support them and continue to lift them and and stand side by side with them as well Excellent. Thank you all so much for these reflections. We have um, a couple of questions from from the audience. Um, I'm going to take Felix's question first. In the meantime, I'm wondering if um, if the tech folks could maybe um, allow Thomas Acton um, onto the floor so he can ask his question. Um, but in the meantime, while that's maybe potentially happening, um, Felix asks, uh, please, have you noticed any special issues for the Roma community in the COVID pandemic, um, presumably referring to, to, to arts and culture, um, and how can we address them? He, and I'll just tag on the second maybe part of his question, policymaking is also an area to influence society. Are there any special measures to encourage Roma youth to seek public office or support those with such ambitions? Um, and maybe we don't need everyone to to respond to um, to e e to the questions. If we could just get maybe one response, and then we have two other questions. Uh, if I may pick up the first one on COVID 19s impact on the Roma arts and culture scene. So immediately after the outbreak of the pandemic, ARIA conducted a survey and connected with its international membership uh, of uh, Roma individuals and organizations and cultural producers. Uh, and uh, we saw how, uh, how uh, the cultural sector is one of the most vulnerable sector of, uh, uh, of the Roma world, actually. And already at uh, the third month uh, of, uh, of after the outbreak of the pandemic, 70% uh, of the cultural producers 
uh, were uh, in loss of uh, their income and their opportunities, uh, and they were in a vulnerable situation. So uh, also, ARIAC is not a traditional grant-giving organization, but uh, the ARIAC Innovation Grant started already in May, and we tried our best to give out small grants to organizations to to support and uh, uh, to and to assist pulling through this extremely difficult time period during the pandemic. Uh, uh, and of course, ERIAC also works in the areas of media uh, and academic uh, scholarship or knowledge production. Uh, so we, um, we also saw how immediately after the outbreak of the pandemic, the scapegoating and disinformation about the Roma community started in, uh, in uh, an anti-Gypsyism increased all around Europe. And I could speak about this forever, but I pass the words to my colleagues. Um, on a more kind of um, practical note, uh, just that as with all other cultural producers, I suppose many, many um, planned exhibitions and events have been, uh, have been canceled or postponed, which is a shame, but in some ways it's generated a, a kind of a new approach to um, to putting online exhibitions. For instance, I've been working with the Romani Cultural and Arts Company with their Gypsy Maker project, and um, we had some exhibitions planned for last year throughout Wales, which we managed one of them before the lockdown came, and then we couldn't realise the other two. So we found kind of innovative ways of, of getting the work out to, to the public to be seen, and also by um substituting planned physical workshops with with online workshops so it's been it's been a great loss in some ways but in some ways it, it's equipped us with some way new ways of working in the future i think great um thomas acton if you can hear this if you would like to ask your question um please request the floor is what the tech people are telling me um or if daniel could could read in the chat i think it's a question for you it's just it's hard for me to know exactly what oh i think thomas is joining us now great so thomas if you could unmute yourself now you can ask your question there should just be a an unmute button at the bottom of your screen Thomas, can you unmute yourself? There should be a, a button at the bottom of your screen. It's like a blue button and you just... So it's the one next to the one you just clicked. No. Okay, no, oh, this is so unfortunate. Is there any way that the tech folks can unmute Thomas? Okay, um, I will try to read your question, Thomas. Um, so da Thomas writes in the chat, um, Daniel speaks of the absence of the human figure, but isn't it very hard for anyone to take a photograph um, if one is, a, is mirror paintings without catching their own figure? So it's a, a little bit of an abstract question, which is why I wanted um, Thomas to try to to explain a little bit his question for us. Um. I will I will just answer that um, in that case. Um, I think I understand what what um, Thomas is saying, um, but as as a, a, a Roma artist, um, those objects, those mirrors that I make, there's no human figure in them. The, the the viewer inhabits the space. If they choose to include their image within their photograph, that's up to them. That's their own agency. It's not mine. So, the opportunity is there for 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 seeing oneself, and I actively encourage that to place oneself in the context of the Roma situation, i.e., see with our eyes if you can. Um, but that's in a way down to the agency of the viewer, not not um, not me. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you for addressing the question. I'm sorry, Thomas, that we couldn't um, get your voice in the space. Um, the
the last maybe question that we'll have, it seems like we're kind of wrapping up. Um, Carmen uh, writes to us and she says, thank you so much for the interesting panel. Um, you might have talked about this already as I had technical issues, but my question would be, what are your thoughts on the conflict of celebrating and proudly practicing uh, traditional popular folkloristic art forms, but at the same time fighting against the stereotypes and culturalization that often come with it from majority societies. Um, so this is actually something we haven't um, necessarily addressed specifically. Um, Rosa, were you able to hear the, the question? If not, it's in the, because you were kind of in and out, it's in the chat if you weren't able to hear it. Yes. Let me re read it and then I might have, I feel I have something to say to this, if I've understood it correctly. One second. <laughs> yes. Um, it is a, um, again, a tension that, you know, I would be that, you know, I have to kind of reflect on, you know, the flamenco dress, we have the image of the um, big flowy dress, big earrings, dark hair, you know, all of those kind of images. And it's, I think, a matter of understanding why, if you choose to dress it within a flamenco context, why that exists. Um, and if you do want to wear that, why you want to wear that and just owning that. So it is, I think about, you know, that's very much present in the flamenco kind of dance world. Um, and I don't see, you know, when I teach, I don't rely on that to make it flamenco. Yeah, so I go back to the basics. I go, if we strip all of it back, it's again about listening. It's about mahala, it's about the energy. It's about, so, you know, th that is a performance. That is a, those are performative um, elements. And I'm aware of that, but I can reclaim that by saying I can exist and dance flamenco in the mahala without any of that. And I can be, you know, and, and that's kind of, the the anchoring and when i teach and you know i don't only teach roma dancers you know i still remind people there's a legacy that came before now you might buy the flamenco dress that is all of that um but that's a choice you're making and i just want you to understand that you don't need that to be flamenco yeah so it, it's very much alive in the context and there are other people that really use it to market and to sell and you know that's the capitalist side of of yeah. The, the 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 culture yeah that people like to use the culture to um for their own benefit yeah absolutely i think i often think of the term res respectability politics when mm. questions like this come up because mm. you know we're not going to stop wearing those things because dominant society is telling us that they're they're stereotypical but like yeah. you say the real essence of it is the is the embodied practice um itself I want to thank you all so much. This was an um, amazing learning experience for me. I've learned so much from all three of you. It's been such a joy to reconnect and be together um, in this online space for, um, for an hour. So thank you uh, so much for your contributions. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been told I need to announce the, the next discussion. So at four, um, there's going to be a moderated discussion um, on the history of the uh, Roma movement with uh, Gratan Puxen and Thomas Acton, who we just saw a minute ago, um, and, part, and who were participants at the first Roma Congress. And um, our colleague, Natalie Tamenko, is going to be moderating that. So um, please stick around. Thank you all so much once again.